I'll be very quick. I've learned a few things in the last session. I come from overseas and I'm a super spreader. But I don't want to scare you off. Uh, I do want to infect you with the excitement that we've got to share. You know, we recently, just last week, uh, merged Ungerbock and Event Booking. So we have our extended family here uh, today. And uh, we're super excited about the future, about better serving the industry, accelerating innovation, and focusing on your success. So we're happy to talk about this. Um, there's one person that's not super excited. He's excited, but also frustrated. Steve McKenzie has tried and tried and tried to be here to share uh, these news with you. And uh, he's locked out of the country, but he'll be here uh, for VMS and other things at the end of the year. So uh, you can talk to him then. Um, so thank you again. And uh, I know the next session is about also what's happened over the last, uh, I guess, a year or, or more on that. And I also want to thank all of you, uh, because we're not forgetting how the last 12, 15 months were and how we all had to stick together as an industry and as partners uh, to be where we are today. So thank you to you all and looking forward to uh, partnering more in the future. Thank you. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, uh, Mr Shane Fitzsimmons, uh, the Commissioner for Resilience New South Wales. Shane Fitzsimmons was appointed as the inaugural Commissioner for Resilience New South Wales and Deputy Secretary Emergency Management with the Department of Premier and Cabinet on the 1st of May 2020. He is currently the Chair of the State Emergency Management Committee, the State Recovery Committee, Board of Commissioners and the National Emergency Medal, Medal Committee. This appointment followed a distinguished career with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service of over 35 years, serving as both a volunteer and a salaried member. In 1998, he was appointed an Assistant Commissioner with the RFS and has held portfolio responsibilities for operations, strategic development and regional management. In 2004, he was appointed the inaugural Australasian Fire Authorities Council Visiting Fellow to the Australian Institute of Police Management for a period of 12 months, developing and delivering in management and leadership. During the period of September 2007 and April 2020, he was the Commissioner of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and was also the Chair of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Bushfire, the Coordinating Committee and the Rural Fire Service Advisory Council. He was also a member of the New South Wales State Emergency Management Committee and the New South Wales State Rescue Board and was Chair of the Rescue Board from 2008 to November 2015. In July 2012, he was appointed a board member of the New South Wales Government Telecommunications Authority. In March 2008, he was appointed a director of the National Area Firefighting Centre and was chair of that board from 2009 to 2013. He was director on the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre from 2009 to 14. He was a member of the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authority Council from 2007 and a member of its board from November 2016 to November 2019 and held the position of Deputy President upon retirement from the board. In January 2016, he was appointed as a councillor of the Royal Humane Society of New South Wales. And on top of all of that, he is a patron of two charities, Kids Express and Coffee for Kids. I'm exhausted just reading all that, Shane. It's fantastic. He was named New South Wales Australian of the Year in 2020. Please welcome to the stage, Mr Shane Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Heather, and good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to join you and Yes, I'm a bit tired listening to that uh, dribble too, thanks Heather, but um, uh, look, thank you. It, it's, it's an opportunity to reflect uh, and to reflect importantly, uh, provide context of, of the fire season of 2019 and 20, but also to reflect on, on what I believe uh, are foundational elements uh, to leadership and in particular uh, leadership in times of crisis and uncertainty. For me, uh, I've had the benefit since I was a teenager of being part of a volunteer organisation, uh, a volunteer organisation that then I grew and developed uh, into a career, uh, and as was indicated, I've spent a few decades there. But what I found in my time with being a volunteer uh, and looking after volunteers uh, right across New South Wales is there's something very, very special and very unique that provides so much underpinning of learning uh, and leadership. Uh, in a volunteer organisation 
uh, the, you, you learn and refine what I believe are the life skills around negotiation, around argument, around compromise, around teamwork, around the need to engage and empower and, in, and provide an inclusive environment where people can feel they contribute and get along and make a difference. There are so many wonderful attributes to volunteers and volunteer organisations and one of their most powerful attributes and special attributes is that they have the art of being able to tell you to get stuffed and go somewhere else if they don't feel that they're being included, if they don't feel that they have a sense of belonging, if they don't feel their voice is heard, if they don't feel um, that they're respected and there's inclusivity and that they're actually making a difference. So with no other motivation than the want to be a part of something uh, and to be able to contribute to one's community um, as part of a team operation, you are relying entirely uh, on the motivations of being able to retain and ensure that that individual's experience is deemed worthwhile and they feel they're making a difference and have that sense of belonging. What I would also say facetiously is that in so many ways, uh, leadership is pretty easy. Um, as I heard at the tail end of the last session, uh, you type in words into Google these days, it's amazing what you find. Type in the word leadership, uh, you'll go to sleep bored witless, uh, reading through thousands of pages of what leadership's all about and, and what people think is important when it comes to leadership. Uh, and it's true, uh, we can all study leadership, we can all get uh, diplomas and degrees and, and, and what have you in leadership, but the, but the real challenge with leadership only comes about when we add in people. Uh, and, and the reality is that we're all a little bit weird, we're all a little bit nuanced, uh, we're all different. Um, and often when it comes to applying leadership, uh, our capacity to understand uh, and connect and motivate uh, and build trust in others can be challenged because we are all different. We are all nuanced differently, we all behave differently, things, things motivate us differently, things challenge us differently, um, but it's that diversity uh, that's fundamental to leadership. The other thing I would also say is leadership in times of crisis is in so many ways and invariably a magnification or amplification of the leadership culture that resides in an organisation in the quiet times. So in my view, the more you invest in your culture, in your leadership culture across the organisation, and ensure that everybody understands that leadership is not the domain or the responsibility of those at the top of the organisational period, but indeed it's an individual and collective responsibility for everybody across the organisation, no matter their tenure, no matter their status, no matter their history or their recency in joining that organisation. Uh, it is absolutely a shared individual and collective responsibility. It does go to the core of culture. So if leadership is ultimately magnified or amplified depending on the lens you're looking through in times of crisis, what I mean by that is if you've got chinks in the armour, if you've got little cracks in the system uh, in your quiet times or your peace time, then you're going to find that those cracks open up to massive crevasses uh, in times of crisis, one way or the other. So a lot of this came about and was certainly quite pronounced uh, as we came into the 2019-20 fire season uh, when I found myself in my role uh, uh, responsible for leading and coordinating the state's firefighting effort, uh, also through the, provision, uh, through the responsibility of providing public information and warnings uh, on a daily basis. And by way of scene setting, uh, the Rural Fire Service is an organisation uh, that, I was, that I was a part of uh, and the commissioner of for, for over a decade, is an organisation made up of about 73,000 uh, members. 99% uh, of that workforce is exclusively volunteer uh, and we have about 1,000 people uh, that um, provide critical roles in an employed sense uh, in a head office environment and then highly decentralised uh, servicing and supporting just over 2,000 local volunteer brigade units around the state. We then also have uh, the responsibility uh, of pulling together uh, the whole of government, the whole of state efforts when it comes to coordinated firefighting, making sure that we've got the fire and rescue service, uh, the, the urban fire services, we've got the national parks firefighting agencies, we've got the forestry uh, corporation firefighting agencies, as and we saw through the fires, every state and territory, um, uh, Commonwealth partners, uh, and offshore partners coming in and working in an organisation integrated into some 
um, common, consistent uh, operating uh, command and control uh, system uh, and environment. So a fairly broad remit of people, um, um, and then on top of that you've got the entirety uh, of, the, of the supporting agencies that are not involved necessarily in the firefighting, uh, but are certainly involved in the, in the firefighting effort, uh, the emergency management framework, which includes your police, your emergency services, your functional areas of government, your business partners and, and what have you. So we found in the lead up to 2019-20, uh, which turned out to be the worst season ever uh, in our state's history, um, that it, it, it ended up being unprecedented in so many ways. Firstly, you won't find me using the phrase black summer bushfires. I know it's the popular vernacular that's running around, but I think it does a significant disservice to communities of New South Wales and further afield that were being so heavily impacted by fires well before we hit the, the summer period. As a matter of fact, people, people forget that during, during winter of 2019, we were averaging just over <coughs> 1,000 fires a month. Uh, June, July, August, more than 1,000 fires a month. And then that simply intensified as we went into September, uh, sorry, as we went into spring uh, and then summer uh, with, a, with a doubling of numbers as we went through September, October, with a significant culmination of damage and destruction uh, as we hit the Christmas New Year period early January. Throughout that fire season, uh, we had just over 11,000 fires across the state. We burnt, the fires burnt out five and a half million hectares, which is effectively about six or seven percent of the geographic area of the state. It's about 80 million hectares. But what's concerning was it was about 20 to 25 percent of the forested country along the Great Dividing Range, which also happens to correlate where a significant proportion of the state's population uh, work and reside. The fires went for a protracted period. Uh, 160 days uh, of significant operational intensity uh, and 200 days of what we call local bushfire emergencies were declared and in place. That's effectively five to six months of the year and if you look back through history, uh, most awful fire seasons, the intensity of the events would last a week or two um, uh, before there was some weather interruption. There were three official state of emergency declaration periods we saw just under, uh, just over two and a, uh, sorry, just under two and a half thousand homes destroyed. Interesting, though, in the same burn scar area, firefighters and emergency services saved fourteen and a half thousand homes. Whilst we necessarily look at the loss, we've also got to look at what was saved. We saw twenty-six fatalities. Twenty-six fatalities, the earliest of which uh, occurred in October, uh, and right through uh, into January. Those 26 fatalities included seven firefighters, four of our volunteers, uh, and three of our air crew uh, that were contracted and operating in New South Wales with the Rural Fire Service. We lost Jeff and Andrew, volunteers just in southwestern Sydney. We lost Sam down near the Victorian border um, near Albury. We lost Cole uh, up in the mountain range west of uh, Eurobadala. And then we lost our three air crew, Ian, Paul and Rick, uh, when their plane crashed uh, down in our high country uh, near Cooma uh, in January. The toll was enormous. The protracted nature was enormous. 59 total fire bans, 11 statewide. And we pulled together a workforce of a scale and of a complexity and of a geographic spread as well as a time duration like we've never seen before in the state of New South Wales. All available state resources were deployed and as I mentioned before, we saw every state and territory contribute to the firefighting effort in this state. We also saw our colleagues from the ADF and the Commonwealth, and we also saw teams coming from New Zealand, United States and Canada. There was just over 6,500 personnel from outside of New South Wales that came in uh, under those arrangements to join the firefighting effort. To signal the scale of the workforce that was on the ground, we were averaging somewhere between 2,500 up to 5,000 people per 12 hour shift on a 24 hour basis. And anyone that's tried to put a roster together uh, to last a few days on a 24 hour cycle, let alone a week, uh, let alone 160 days, will have some appreciation of the complexity and the volume of people that churns through to sustain that sort of effort. The Premier had decided to issue citations to those involved in the frontline firefighting effort. And so far we've issued about 75,000 citations to those that were formally contributing to that to that effort. 
So we're talking about a significant, sustained, relentless, damaging, destructive, tragic set of circumstances that lasted a considerable period of time for New South Wales. And at the core of, the core of seeking to motivate, engage, sustain and support workforces and communities, we had to lean very heavily, uh, not only on the very best we could when it came to the firefighting arsenal and the firefighting technique and the firefighting methodologies and all that came to bear, we also had to rely very much on our ability to engage and connect through public information and warnings, uh, our ability to connect and engage with our workforces, but also all those being impacted and affected uh, by the immediacy of what was unfolding, but also what was being forecast to happen uh, in the days and weeks uh, ahead based on the forecast. At the core of leadership for me, leadership, whether it's in the quiet times, but particularly uh, in the times of crisis or uncertainty, is actually about seeking to build trust and confidence. We're trying to build trust and confidence in those that we're relying on and those that we're trying to serve and protect and take with us uh, on the journey. And for me, there's about half a dozen key attributes that I think are core, no matter which way you want to cut it up. First and foremost, I think authenticity is at the heart of what we need to do uh, when it comes to exampling leadership. And what I mean by that is, starting with you as the individual, understanding and accepting your own strengths, your own limitations, and owning them and accepting them, but also understanding and accepting the role that you play in a much broader uh, operating environment. I think, it's also, I think it's also most fundamentally about being really clear and authentic about what it is you, your team, your community, your customer is dealing with. There's a pretty crude phrase that, I've, that I grew up with, and I won't use it in its fullest of terms, but it goes to the words of the effect of, there's no point giving al alarmism, and there's no point underselling it. So if you are confronted with a dog poop sandwich, don't try and convince everybody it's fairy bread. Because the reality is, they will work it out pretty quickly. They will work it out through smell, through taste and whatever. And no matter how much you try and sell it, if you're not being honest, your teams, your audience, your, uh, your customer are going to cut through very, very quickly. So the reality is keeping it real, keeping it real with the person in the mirror, keeping it real with the teams, keeping it real with those you're seeking to engage and connect with, and in our case, those you are seeking to serve and protect, was absolutely fundamental. So authenticity uh, is key. What follows very closely to that for me is humility and empathy. And what I mean by humility is, as leaders, absolutely, we take our role seriously and our part in the broader team effort, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. Don't lose our sense of humour. Uh, don't lose the ability to connect and realise that it's actually about everybody else and it's not about you. And if it's reaching the point where it's all about you, then I suggest you've probably gone and expired uh, your viable tenure in that role. So the more you understand and appreciate that it's actually about others, it's about other people when it comes to leadership is really important. I think empathy is fundamentally linked uh, to humility uh, and empathy then extends uh, through to other areas around compassion. So the more you can understand and relate and connect with and appreciate what your people are doing, what they're going through, how you understand and connect with those in your team, your subordinates, your peers, uh, your, your reports, your political masters, your board, whatever it is, and most importantly, your audience, your customer, uh, uh, your community. Understanding and connecting and trying to relate as much as you can uh, to, where, to where all those other people are is, is fundamental. I think there's many silver linings in COVID, but I think the last, the last 12 months, one of the key silver linings out of COVID is that it's been a, it's been a level up for all of us. Uh, disasters, interruptions usually happen to somebody else or somewhere else, but COVID, has meant that none of us have been immune. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you are. Uh, we've all been impacted and affected. Uh, and the ability then for all of us in making decisions corporately, organisationally, personally, family, social groups and what have you, there's been a direct ability for all of us to be cognizant about connecting and relating and sharing uh, with all of those around us and our teams and our people 
have absolutely thrived in that environment because they can see that leaders in their workplace that they might only communicate with or see an email from time to time or, or pass in the, in the corridor, up in the office or, or in the workshop, to see them on Teams meetings and to see them sharing the, the levels of shared uncertainty and the decisions being taken and why they're being taken and so on. So understanding and connecting with people is really important. Mutual respect, inclusivity is absolutely paramount and having grown up in the volunteer organisation, uh, ensuring that we can engage and connect with uh, a diverse mix of people from all different walks, and back, uh, walks of life and different backgrounds uh, is really important. But for me, when it comes to mutual respect, there's an old phrase that I also grew up with that was instilled into my sisters and I. Um, the phrase goes, manners cost you nothing, but the lack of them can cost you everything. And as we translate into adult life and we translate into uh, leadership and, and understanding the need to connect with and, and be inclusive with our teams, it reminds us that if we maintain civility, if we maintain basic courtesies, we can prosecute and argue with vigour, we can challenge, we can accept and engage in getting the diversity of opinions and backgrounds and, and insights uh, or perspectives on strategy, uh, on, on decisions, on actions, on contemplations or scenarios that we're weighing up uh, in that critical time uh, of crisis particularly. You don't have the time to, to contemplate and reflect like you do in quiet time or business time. So in crisis time, you want to draw on that diversity. You want to draw on that, on that, on that inclusiveness of a variety of people uh, and perspectives to make sure you're weighing up and making the best decisions you can. And in our case, a lot of those decisions that were being taken were absolutely decisions around uh, potentially life and death with a focus on the preservation of life. The next point would be around decisions and actions. Um, and there's plenty of studies around and plenty of evidence around that shows that in the workplace, um, indecision um, is, is one of the things that often um, creates the greatest demotivation of people in the workplace, often uh, or invariably uh, staff and, and, and organisational members are happier with decisions they don't like that are decisions that are taken and explained on why they're taken than no decision at all. Uh, the procrastination around not doing anything uh, uh, really demotivates and drives people crazy. But so too does the inaction um, uh, or the lack of action from, from, leadership, uh, from leaders and managers, uh, and particularly inaction around poor performance and poor behaviour uh, or, or poor strategies uh, or programs that are not executing as was initially intended. And what I mean by that is, um, particularly looking after a volunteer organisation, you're trying to build a strong culture. Your, your focus is always on any organisation around culture. But most importantly in a volunteer organisation, the only thing you've got to hold people accountable for performance and behaviour comes down to culture, comes down to values, and attached to values, so importantly, are behaviours. Uh, those behaviours that are encouraged and expected and those behaviours that will not be tolerated. If you want to shift culture, if you want to ensure your values are aligning, make sure you articulate what are acceptable and unacceptable uh, uh, behaviours uh, and hold people accountable for that, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. And in this era of, of COVID, um, I don't know how many of you heard about, there's this, there's this narrative called uh, the emotional contagion. Um, and in a workplace, uh, if you've got optimism, positivity, decisiveness, action oriented innovation, then you will find that that, 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 that that spreads positively through your organisation, through your teams. But similarly, if you've got poor performance, poor behaviour and inaction, poor attitudes, negativity, pessimism, all those sorts of things, if no one's doing anything about it, if no one's correcting it, then unfortunately you'll find it too uh, will tend to spread uh, like an emotional uh, contagion in the workplace. So making decisions and taking action is fundamental, particularly in times of crisis, and explaining why those decisions and actions are taken, but be seen to be making those decisions and taking that action. I would also liken it to the analogy of the flat tyre. Sometimes the intervention to adjust strategy, steady the course, deal with an individual, deal with a team, um, the flat tyre analogy works for me because sometimes the intervention is simply about putting on a on a tyre valve, pushing the button, reinflating the tyre, the intervention can be pretty slight and away you go, the tyre the, the goes off, the wheel rolls away. 
but sometimes the intervention might need to be a little bit firmer. It might need to be a little bit more intrusive. So you might find that there's actually a puncture in this tyre. You've got to get in and you've got to plug the tyre. Then you can reinflate it and away it goes. But the reality is also that sometimes we've got to realise uh, that the intervention is at a point where we've got to accept uh, that the situation is, is beyond repair. The tyre is actually stuffed. So whether, whether it's time to move the individual on or time to adjust strategy or ditch strategy and choose something else, the sooner we do it, we swap in the new tyre, we reinflate, and away we go, the wheel will roll on. The flat tyre is important for me too, because ultimately, if that flat tyre is on the front wheel of your bus that's carrying your team, your department, your organisation, uh, then the reality is no one's going anywhere until someone's willing to get out and address the flat tyre. The fifth area that I will talk about is communications. Uh, and, and communicating internally or externally is absolutely fundamental. Um, and what we find during crisis and what we found during the, uh, the fires particularly, and we're seeing it continue through, through COVID, uh, is that we did daily press conferences. And every time we were doing those press conferences, uh, I thought about two broad audiences the entire time, uh, and we tried to cover off five or six broad themes in every communicate. The two audiences were the workforce the men and women that we were relying on 24 hours a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, to keep turning up, to make a difference, no matter how relentless the circumstances were and how deflating the circumstances were when we thought we were gaining the upper hand and we had a bad weather event, we were getting down to 40 fires, we thought we were having a good day, uh, and then a dry lightning storm would come across and we found ourselves back to 170 fires within about 12 hours. It was pretty demotivating, pretty deflating to keep getting people back. But recognising that they're a critical audience, so too are their family and loved ones. And then the second broad audience were the men and women, the householders, the farmers, the businesses, the communities that were being impacted and affected and threatened uh, by the fires on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And every time we communicated it as, authentic, as authentically and as, and as, as much clear language as we possibly could, de-jargonised, um, we just made it very clear that we wanted to give an honest and candid update of what we knew, um, what the latest stats were, what we knew, what we were expecting in the forecast. We also would then talk about what we were doing and importantly, why we were doing it. We would then talk about what we're not doing or we can't do and why we believe we couldn't or couldn't do that. And then the final thing we were calling on was what did we want others to do? What did we want the community to do? What did we want the firefighters and everybody else to keep doing? And why we wanted them to do that? And we found uh, that we saw an extraordinary response, not only from the workforces, but we also saw an extraordinary response from the communities. Considered sensible decisions were being taken, decisions that were being taken that indisputably directly correlated with the saving of life. Objective analysis showed that as awful and as tragic as 20, 27 lives lost was, uh, in that fire season, um, given the intensity and the scale and breadth of damage and fire behaviour, uh, conservatively, uh, based on historical events, we should have been counting the death toll in the hundreds. So the fact that people were listening, were able to get messages out, people made decisions uh, uh, and, and acted accordingly. The final attribute I would focus on centres around a word that I don't think is used enough uh, in leadership circles, uh, is care. It, it ties right back uh, to, to authenticity, humility and empathy and, and everything else that I talked about. But if leaders genuinely care, if they care about their subordinates, if they care about their teams, if they care about their colleagues, if they care about their, their supervisors and their reports above, their political masters or whatever, and if they genuinely care about their customers or their clientele uh, or their community, uh, then I believe that will come through. And in times of crisis, in times of adversity, that care, in my view, correlates fundamentally to presence. Uh, being present in the darkest of times, being present when the bad news is around, being, being present when things go wrong is absolutely fundamental. And backing in your teams and your organisation when they're making decisions, life and death decisions, particularly where those de decisions and those strategies don't execute uh, as one was hoping or one was anticipating or one was expecting based on the analysis. Examples included during the fire season that whilst 96% of all the backburns worked very well uh, and did the job, there was a number of backburns that were implemented uh, that went wrong. They breached containment lines in the worst case scenario 
a couple of them resulted in actually damaging and destroying uh, property and homes. Now, if I stood up as a leader and started questioning that in the middle of crisis, I would have lost the entire workforce. But I knew through talking to them and talking with our teams, they were making the best decisions they could with the best data, the best information. Things can go wrong, but if your people are doing the very best they can, then the reality is you can ask nothing more of them. And similarly, uh, when, the, when the tragedy struck and we lost people, uh, being present uh, at the accident scene, spending time with those on site, experiencing the trauma, spending time with family and loved ones, um, uh, talking to them about the fact that, that their loved ones are not coming home uh, and connecting with them and being with them, uh, in my view, that is fundamental and critical uh, uh, for leaders. And in showing care, genuine and sincere care, uh, and expressing um, authenticity, empathy and humility, it's also okay and appropriate, in my view, particularly in times of crisis, uh, uh, for, for leaders to be compassionate uh, and demonstrate levels of vulnerability. It was an extraordinary period. It was unprecedented in so many ways. But we've now experienced it, so it's no longer unprecedented. The reality is, as we go forward, we've now got to look at the events of the 2019-20 fire season and get ready in our mind, in our planning, in our contemplations, that we've now experienced a new level of extreme and raising the bar to what we can do and how we can, how we can go forward, the, the, the circumstances are reset in terms of strategy, tactics, resources, logistics, infrastructure, what have you. But at the core of that too is the, is the criticality to make sure we retain and grow and develop leadership culture across our organisations and across our communities. I think as awful as the season was, it also put us in a good stead uh, to see, um, um, as it was the case with me and the government through the Minister and the Premier, joined up demonstrating to the communities of New South Wales uh, that the highest levels of the state were working together we're seeing that again through COVID, and the core of that leadership is actually about building trust and confidence by being open and honest with what we know, what we don't know, what we're doing and why we're doing it, what we're not doing, why we can't doing it, and most importantly, uh, what we want other people to do is fundamental. I will just conclude and hand over to questions. I know I've got, oh no, sorry, I've got a couple of minutes. Um, the other thing that's important, particularly in, in my new role with resilience leading up an unprecedented fire season, we've got unprecedented recovery. And recovery, by default, tends to go to rebuilding, reconstruction, repair, new buildings, new infrastructure. But at the core of recovery, too, is healing, community healing. And in the last few months, some of the most challenging conversations that I've had uh, centre around kitchen tables, local pubs, local parks, local community groups, individuals, families, what have you, but also uh, with former colleagues on the phone and I remember one call very vividly on the way home one night, uh, talking to a colleague, uh, reflecting on the anniversary of the last season. Uh, and it was an emotional conversation, both ends of the phone. And he then said to me, he said, um, but I'm going okay. And I said, that's good. I said, are you getting some support? He said, yes, I am. He said, I'm accessing the support and services and it's making a difference. I said, what's it doing for you? He said, I didn't realise how much I was shutting my wife out. He said, I didn't realise how much I was not um, connecting with my kids. And he said, I didn't realise how cranky I was and, and how on edge I was back at work trying to deal with, deal with the team and, and my volunteers. And I said, but is it helping you? He said, yeah, it's absolutely helping me. And I said, are you going to keep going? He said, yes, I am. I said, that's great, mate. I'm really proud of you. And then he said, no, I will. I'll keep going. He said, but Shane, can you promise me something? I said, yeah, what's that? And he said, I need you to promise me that you won't tell anyone. I said, I won't tell anyone what? He said, I don't want you to tell anybody that I'm getting help. And I said, What? I said, you've got to be flipping kidding me. I didn't say flipping. I said, I said you've got to be kidding me. I said, after everything that's unfolded, uh, what's the problem? And he said, I don't want anyone to judge me. He said, I don't want anyone to think that I'm not coping. I don't want anyone to think uh, that, I'm, that I'm not going okay. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm not capable of coming back to work and continuing to do something that I'm really passionate about. And I said, I said you really give me the irrits. I said, but I'll, I'll promise you I won't. I won't mention you. I said, but I'm going to tell this story as much as I can. Because that story, along with the countless other conversations I've had with people in community that say to me, um, can someone talk to mum and dad? Can someone get out and see my father? Can someone see my husband? Can someone see my grandfather? 
He's wandering around the property. He won't talk to anyone. He won't put his hand up for help. He thinks he's going to fix all the fences and get the business back up and running and do this and do that. He thinks there's people worse off and there's no way uh, that they're going to go out and get some support um, um, uh, with the systems that are available and certainly uh, not get any counselling or mental health support. And the genuine concerns that are coming back from the family uh, and neighbours is that they don't want those people to give up hope. They don't want them to find where they are so overwhelming that they give up on life. And the message for me in crisis and in leadership is that we've got to do our bit to destigmatise uh, and realise that resilience and strength uh, is absolutely through lived experience and it's normal. Resilience is about stoicism, it is about strength, it's about learning from lived experiences and being able to ready ourselves and be better for the next disruption, for the next emergency, for the next disaster. We prepare ourselves in an anticipatory sense, we endure it, we respond to it, but then we come out the other side um, uh, better and stronger and wiser. But let's not kid ourselves that in times of crisis, in times of uncertainty, that emotions, feelings, thoughts are not impacted and often impacted extremely adversely. So for all of us, and dare I say it, particularly men, um, um, there's big lifting to do. We've got to destigmatise as much as we can that profound emergencies and disasters, times of crisis, come with big impact. And it's normal to be impacted and affected, but it's also normal to be wanting to talk to one another, share with one another, and reach out for, service, uh, for services and supports to help you get through it. <coughs> the second phrase I won't use in this last year is social distancing. I get it, I understand it, but what we're talking about is physical distancing. Now more than ever, we need to be more connected, businesses, employees, teams, volunteers, communities, families, we need to be more connected than ever before. We don't want to exacerbate loneliness, isolation, depression, anxiety. So leadership in crisis or in uncertainty is critical through leading by example <clears throat> and those half a dozen attributes I mentioned. Happy to have questions. Thank you, Shane. We'll let you grab a drink. Yeah. Okay, we have our first question. Hi Shane, uh, Milton O'Brien, Venues Canberra. Thanks for your uh, your time today. I've got two questions. Um, there was a media conference uh, with yourself and I think the Premier and a couple of others where I think the Premier said the, the Feds were bringing in some, um, some Defence Force people and you look really pissed off. And so I'm wondering, was there a time at all over that period where you and, and, the, and the state or federal governments didn't agree on the approach that you recommended? And secondly, were there, was there a day or days where you thought, if this goes to shit now, we're going to lose hundreds? <clears throat> oh, look, so, 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 so just to clarify the, the, the history books there, um, there was an announcement that was made uh, at the federal level, which was done so without any consultation or connection uh, with the state uh, or with the state-led uh, operation. I vented my frustration. Um, well, sorry, I didn't vent it. I was actually pretty candid about my disappointment in that uh, in, a, in a morning interview. And then that carried through into a press conference. And I clarified what that was all about. And as they say, the rest is history. <clears throat> I honestly didn't think it would attract the attention that it did. Um, but, but it is what it was. Uh, and, and at the time, I just called it for what it was. Um, and the, the key issue was, you can't make announcements about things that are going to happen and announce new evacuation centres being available that aren't factored into the operational strategy and the whole communication that's going to community about where we want people to go and move and have mixed messages coming out. So if leadership in times of crisis is all about trust and confidence, then putting out extra information or divergent information which is not integrated or part of the picture is counter to that. So that was where I vented my frustration. The second part of your question um, around days where we thought we were going to have considerable loss, uh, there, there, were, there were many. Um, there were many days where, where the signals were showing extraordinary spread and impact um, that if we didn't intervene, if we didn't do uh, what, we, what we set out to do, then the consequences were, were enormous. Uh, and there are, there are still pockets across the fire ground to this day where myself and others reflect uh, how they didn't spread, how they didn't break out under some of the conditions we experienced. 
and particularly given that during this season we've got really good expertise in Australia. We have the best fire predictive specialists um, uh, in, in our operations centre during these fires. So what they are, they're individuals that have the expertise to look at topography, look at a whole bunch of conditions, landscape conditions, weather conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And they can, based on all those actual and forecast elements, predict pretty accurately where they think a fire will spread to. And then we've also got computer simulation tools that actually run those predictive assessments for us as well in parallel. And as a general uh, explanation, they will come up with three markers. Under X, Y and Z conditions, this fire is likely to spread this far under best case scenario, this far under worst case scenario, but given our assessment, we believe it'll land somewhere here. And they're pretty damn accurate. But what we found during this fire season was that a number of the fires, many of the fires, were exceeding worst case scenario. And they were exceeding worst case scenario not at 2, 3 and 4 in the afternoon, which is where we normally see the worst of fire behaviour because it's hotter, drier, windier, etc. We were seeing that at 2, 3 and 4 in the morning. So the moisture deficit in the landscape, um, the profound drought that was the worst in, 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 in centuries, meant that we had fire behaviour 24 hours a day um, uh, that was exceeding uh, known convention in, in so many ways. Uh, I'll, I'll, go, I'll just take whatever I can hear. I can see hands up all over the place. Yeah. Uh, Lou, do you want to speak loudly? Oh, hang on. No, no, we can't hear you. I, can't, I can hear you. No, I'm coming. <coughs> Here I am, coming. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lou from the Sydney Opera House. I was wondering across this time, as you as a leader and as a person, if there's stuff that you learnt across the five months to make, to keep your mental health okay and you as a person okay? Oh, look, I, I, there's no doubt uh, for me what I found. Um, as a leader my whole life, I've never, I've always been of the view, never ask of others what you're not willing to do yourself. So while I was, while I was focused on trying to get people out day after day, week after week, month after month, I knew I had a role to play and I, my, my commitment was to do that to my very best, as I was expecting that of everybody else. Um, the truth be known, I probably didn't, well, I know I didn't pay too much attention to myself at all. Um, and as a matter of fact, the days were, were really long uh, and they were enduring. And it wasn't until after the fire season I realised how much of a toll the season did have on me. Um, I, I was very public, I was emotionally broken um, uh, quite a number of times, particularly with the death around our... Uh, the death of our firefighters, but also the death uh, more broadly in the community. Um, and, and in small communities, you can never overestimate um, the points of connection and separation. Um, and I remember very vividly with the first deaths that we were anticipating, I shot straight up to the, to the north coast. We had some intel that, that two people were unaccounted for and they were highly likely in the building and the, it, was, it wasn't public at that stage, but that's where we were. And my instinct was to get up to Casino to be with the, with the team that was presiding over that fire. Um, and, and it turned out uh, within a few hours the, the following day of, of getting up there that they had found the, the, the couple in the home uh, deceased, the remains of the couple in the home. And I was talking with the teams while I was up there and the contractors that we were using to fuel all the aircraft on our operating base that I'd been having a cup of tea with and a sandwich with, the couple that we found deceased in the home was actually their father and grandfather. Um, so you just never know where the connections are and how that impacts uh, your entire team. So the amount of time you spend over and over again about being present and connected with people, it builds up and has an, has an effect on you. There's no doubt about it. And I don't know how many of you have got these smart watches, uh, but I did find um, um, a new feature in them that I didn't know about. But if your heart rate suddenly starts to accelerate to really high levels and the watch realises you're not moving, it actually sends out alarms. It, it activates some sort of alarm. I don't know what it is, but I looked down and found that when I was sitting ready to do an address at a funeral of one of the firefighters, my watch was alarming and I had a really high heart rate being triggered 
uh, on, the, on, the, on the phone. Cut a long story short, when I, when I stood down from the role, um, about a month or so after standing down from the role, I could not shake headaches at all. I ended up going to see a doctor and my blood pressure was through the roof. I was a, I was 100 and something on 100 and something and it was, it was really bad. Um, but as they say, it's the silent killer for a reason because the individual isn't conscious of their blood pressure rising um, and they put it down to the six months of the, of the season. So physically, I clearly didn't do enough um, uh, to look after myself, um, but, but emotionally, uh, I, found, I found the ability to maintain connection <clears throat> with my colleagues, maintain a reference point um, that, that we were all there for a reason, we all had a, a significant role to play, and that the community would be very much the poorer if we didn't um, um, commit to what we had to do. Um, but being very open as much as you can and share uh, with your colleagues, with your teams, about the fact that you are impacted, you are affected too, and that you, like them, are not alone in the challenges and the concerns. And for me, maintaining a reference point too, if I thought I was having a bad day, uh, there was plenty of others having an, an even worse day. Um, so perspective also helped. <clears throat> Thanks, Shane. And we have another one here. Steve Knuth with the Sydney Opera House. Was there a point in time during that season when you realised this is not like anything else? And second to that, you know, did you then have to start making decisions about how we maintain this longevity and intensity we now are faced with? Yes, there was. And interestingly, the previous fire season, so that would have made it 18, 19, the previous fire season, as an outlook map went, had almost an identical outlook for an above normal fire season for New South Wales. As a matter of fact, the area expecting above normal conditions the year before was greater in ge geography. It was, it was a greater geographic area. The difference was that the weather elements did not materialise and were not sustained during the spring and summer period <clears throat> like we saw during the 1920 season. So, so I realised pretty early on in the winter <clears throat> that when we were averaging 1,000 fires a month already, that the landscape was particularly dry. And the only good thing in a profound drought is that west of the Great Dividing Range, there's little or no fuel to burn. So agriculture was stuffed, there was no grass around, there was no feed around, no one could grow crops, blah, blah, blah. So you could write off effectively, you know, three quarters of the state and know that you're not gonna have very many fires out there because there's nothing to burn. But as you came across the Great Dividing Range, 2019 turned out to be the hottest and driest year on record. Um, and it was on the back end of many years of profound drought. The moisture deficit in the landscape and the vegetation meant that fire was burning through rainforests that historically don't burn. Normally there's enough residual moisture in rainforests that the fires would, would largely self-extinguish as they came into the, into the forest fuel and, and what have you. We saw, we saw underground fires burning, one of the longest fires burning, uh, the back end of Port Macquarie. Uh, it burnt for months and months and months and every now and then it would surface, take along on the road, then it would go back under uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the fuels and then it would go back underground and just keep burning away. The ground has settled given so much that it's burned underground. So normally you would expect, even if it's a hot outlook, it is very rare that we would go weeks without some frontal system moving across the state that would disrupt the weather. We would get a cold front, we would get some showers, we would get, we would get them somewhere across the state and the normal fire season would be starting in the north and then progressively moving south because as a subtropical influence comes in, then there's a bit of moisture up in northeast New South Wales, so it takes a bit of sting out of it and you, the threat moves further south. 2019 ended up being one of the latest onsets of monsoonal activity uh, on record and the hot air mass that sat over the centre of Australia was never interrupted with cyclonic activity uh, that was coming down through the centre of Australia. That's when we started to get the signal that every week or every month, the Bureau kept saying the next three months um, is nothing but above normal temperatures and below average rainfall. So we knew it just kept building and they intensified their forecasting over the weeks and months and no matter what models they ran, no matter what variations they ran, we couldn't get meaningful moisture coming through. And it was probably about... Um, uh, September, October, 
that they started signalling the potential for some moisture towards the end of January or February. And then it wasn't really until February that we finally got some moisture. And every frontal activity that moved across, all that it brought was lightning. Uh, and every, every time we had lightning, invariably, because the ground was so dry, we had numerous new fires. And often those fires might have been within hundreds of metres or kilometres uh, outside a, a fire containment line that crews had been working two months on holding. So, so much of that effort was all just gone. The, so then what they were saving and protecting and stopping was now being burnt out. So it, it, it just built through the whole season. Uh, we just didn't have the moisture. That, that's when it really became, became apparent. In the lead up to that, we were working with authorities around New South Wales pre-positioning bulk water supplies because there was, there, was so, there was so little water in so many towns um, that if we had a house fire, uh, we didn't have a lot to put them out with. So we had to pre-position bulk water lots in a lot of rural and regional towns so we had something to fight house fires with. Great, thanks Shane. And another one up here. <coughs> Hi, Shane. It's Pedro from Kegel in Australia. Um, one of the questions that I have is, as we are seeing that global warming is heavily changing, climate change, how important do you think business should realise their corporate responsibility in reducing carbon emissions to avoid global warming worsening? So, so look, um, I'm probably not going to get into the debate around uh, carbon emissions, but what I would say is, uh, for a long time now, we have been tracking the science and tracking the forecasts and realising, uh, in, in, in a pragmatic sense, that disaster seasons and fire seasons are going to get longer and hotter, that weather events are going to be more frequent and more intense, uh, that storms are going to increase. And over the last couple of decades, we've had good success uh, with New South Wales government particularly, from my perspective, but also more broadly, around getting support uh, for investments in infrastructure, for investments in different strategies, different equipment, different assets, different policy frameworks, uh, recognising and anticipating that change of environment. I cannot tell you how grateful I was uh, to see that we were the only jurisdiction in Australia that, using the foundation argument, that our window, our, our fire seasons were getting longer and hotter in New South Wales, uh, in Australia. The same was being held for, for Northern um, um, America, Canada uh, and Europe. Accessing global assets like large air tankers and those sorts of things uh, was, was getting increasingly different because they wanted them longer, we wanted them earlier and they can't be in the same place at, uh, at once. So being able to secure our own dedicated um, key assets and those sorts of things is an example of that. So the reality is yes, we need to be awake to it. We need to be mindful of the fact that, 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 that things are changing. And whilst the last season was unprecedented, it is no longer unprecedented. We've got to get ahead around the fact that it's a signal of the new extreme. I think the disappointing thing when it comes to discussions, social discussions like climate change um, and what that means is that we, we all want to land um, in the social discussion uh, at, one, at either end of the spectrum. So you, you've either got to be in the camp of the of, of, of the morons at one end or the crazies at the other end. We, 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 we miss the ability to have the meaningful and cogent discussion uh, in the middle where it counts the most. Uh, what can we do now to ameliorate and prevent? And what do we need to do now in terms of investment in strategy, policy and other things? Um, uh, and dare I say it, more importantly than anything else, awareness um, um, so people actually understand and personalise their risk and do something about it. Um, um, so that we can anticipate and be ready for uh, that, that already uh, changing environment. Do we have any, another question? <coughs> yep. Jim? Jim Fiddler. Um, previous life, uh, a mantra I had to live by was respect is earned and not given. Mr Simmons, you've definitely got my respect as a leader. Um, and I think we all go for that one. Uh, another one is um, the oh shit moment. When did that hit you during that season and what got you through it? Was I've it your training, your family? What kicked in and think, right, the ball's in my court and this is it? I think the oh shit moment, it's, it's not about when did it happen, it's probably about how often did it happen. Um, um, and, and that's a reality. I mean, there were some, there were some, really, there were some really difficult times there. Um, um, but I have always been a, a pretty open book. Um, People won't leave a room with me in a meeting or any other forum uh, and be in doubt about what's on my mind. 
Um, I won't. I have no problem going in with view A uh, and being convinced by people that tell me how wrong my view is and how stupid it is, and here's the reason why I should rethink that view. And I'm happy to walk out with view B. I, I, I'm a very open book in that regard. Um, and so too was the case uh, when we were dealing with really awful uh, circumstances and contemplations that I had to be as open and as honest as I possibly could internally with the team. Um, I leverage and rely enormously uh, on my team, uh, on, on my colleagues, on my peers, uh, and indeed through the fires, um, um, you need to know that you've got the backing uh, of, your, of your supervisors, of your, and for me, um, knowing that we had the uh, the unequivocal backing uh, of the Minister and the Premier and the Government uh, in understanding what, the, what was at risk, what decisions were being taken and why, and backing that in was really, really important. Uh, in, my, in my darkest of moments, um, there is no doubt, um, and I remember you know, um, some of those overnight visits, uh, visiting families and spending time with Andrew and Jeff's family, uh, and then Sam's family. Um, um, I remember the minute I got into my car or a quiet space on my own, um, I just had to ring home. I, I just rang, I rang my wife and rang Lisa and, and um, there, is, there is a truism in my view that sometimes the most important and powerful things are the things you don't say. I just needed to ring somebody um, uh, and let down. I, 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 was, I was emotionally broken uh, on so many of those things and I just needed to be able to connect uh, and vent uh, and then get my get my thoughts back together. And on those couple of mornings, particularly, by the time uh, we got back from from visiting uh, back into the office, um, I was able to refocus and tune, have a shower and a shave, and get ready, you know, for the for the press conference uh, in an hour or so. So, so being able to do that and take stock uh, and have the confidence in being able to be pretty open and share with your team, I think, is really important. They need to know who you are and what you are and what it's doing to you because it's actually doing stuff to them. If they can't trust you and see the real you, then how, how are you going to engender trust in them? Terrific, thank you. I've, I've just got one question, Shane. You're Commissioner for Resilience. Do you think uh, we teach resilience well enough in schools nowadays? And kids' upbringing nowadays is probably very different to uh, your upbringing, my upbringing. How do we build resilience. Uh, we just heard from Gail that uh, millennials are going to be taking over the workforce in the not too distant future. How do we make sure we get resilience in our workforces and, and in the workforce coming through? So it's a really good question and I'm mindful of time and I'll truncate this right down yeah. as quickly. I have a bad habit of why say in two words what you can say in 20. Um, <laughs> um, when I first accepted this role, it wasn't called resilience. It was something like you know, disaster and emergency management for New South Wales, and it made sense to me, I'm a simple firefighter. But then as I got really close to the, to the announcement, the government said, we want to call it resilience. And I remember saying, what the bloody hell's resilience? No one's going to relate to resilience if we should just call it for what it is. Well, I've had to eat humble pie because I don't know, I'm, I'm convinced it's not my antenna being finely tuned to the word, but the last 12 months, and we've only been around for 12 months now as a new agency, I can't remember the word resilience being used more in the last 12 months ever in my life. Um, family discussions, social discussions, workplace discussions, media, mainstream, you name it, it's a word that's used everywhere. And it got me, it got me, to, it got me to focus on reading, researching, but connecting and listening with people about what they saw as resilience. The simple definition that often comes up is bouncing back to normal after disaster or emergency. I don't, I don't cop that, I, I, I don't support it. Why would anyone want to go back to normal if they've just been completely displaced or, or affected? You've got to come out of whatever you experience better and stronger. But resilience is about lived experiences. Whether we're little kids or adults, there are things that happen in our life that shape who we are and what we are. Uh, and it's through those lived experiences that we learn to ready ourselves and prepare ourselves for the next one. And hopefully we're stronger and wiser. There's some great literature coming out of, 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 a, of, a, of a mob in America. I think it's a psychology association. They describe resilience like a canoeist going down a river. There are times in life where you're going through the river in your kayak uh, and it's tranquil, peaceful, beautiful, serenity's wonderful, but every now and then you're going to hit some turbulent water. 
And the first time you hit that turbulent water, it's like, oh shit, you know, and you're trying to work out and navigate, but you learn a few skills and you, and you work out, you know, how, how your, your kayak can be punished. And then you'll come back into clear water though and you can ready yourself. But the idea is you're better for the experience, you're, um, you've got new skills, you're ready for the next one. The next one might bust your kayak up, but when you come out the other side, you've realised your kayak wasn't strong enough, so you're going to get a new kayak which is stronger because, again, you've got that lived experience. So the simple answer to your question is, I think the more we talk about those lived experiences and recognising that resilience is about learning, it is about lived experience, it's actually about readying ourselves as individuals, families, businesses and communities, readying ourselves for the next one, doing the low cost, no cost investment strategies that can make a difference in a preemptive, um, preventative and mitigation sense, endure that next disruption, but again come out the other side better and stronger. But in acknowledging that resilience is about strength and stoicism and learning, also acknowledge that those lived experiences are often terribly emotionally traumatic and that we've also got to do our bit to get through that because it's the inability to share what those lived experiences do to us, our thoughts, feelings and emotions, which is where I think we seem to struggle the most. Terrific. Thank you. Please thank Shane. Thank you.